Olympic trials? In the, Omaha. Is that where they are this year? Yeah, the swimming class. Swimming, oh. I've been to the track and field up in like Eugene once. Mm -hmm. for, well, it, was, it wasn't the Olympic, it was the NC2A, but I really like the track and field. I, I mean, I'm a, well, somewhat of a reluctant guest, but I'm getting kind of pumped up about it. I think it'll be interesting. Were you a swimmer? No, I'm not a swimmer, but we know a swimmer. Uh -huh. Is it quieter here? We can all hear it? Yeah, a little better, a little better. Okay, I started off, first of all, my name is Michael James, and I am a veteran of the uh, 1968 Democratic Convention demonstrations. And I would like to thank uh, John Thomas, uh, of East West University, and anyone else who helped make this possible. Um, I always like talking about past events because I think we learn from our history and it helps us go forward. Um, I, uh, I think the first thing I wanted to say is that 1968 was a hell of a year. You know, it, it definitely was not just uh, the Democratic Convention here in town, but you had things going on in Prague, you had things going on in Germany, in France, uh, in England. And I think one of the most important things to remember is what happened at the uh, in Mexico City when uh, people were massacred uh, when they were protesting the, the, you know, the 68 Olympics were coming in there. Uh, was it the Olympics? Yeah, it was. And, um, and a number of, I think, 300 people were killed then. So it's, uh, we were not the only game in town. There were a lot of other things going on. And I think it's also important to remember that this didn't just happen by osmosis, that it, uh, there were things that came before. Uh, let's think about, uh, let's just start at the Second World War. You had people coming back from the Second World War. They had uh, expectations that were not necessarily, they had rising expectations. You had uh, people uh, demanding uh, better treatment around race relations. Uh, you had uh, the Mississippi summer with Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner were, were killed in Mississippi. Uh, there was a lot of activity. And uh, I think we're indebted to all the people in all the places uh, around all the issues that take a stand for justice and a better life. And uh, I'm internally grateful to all of those folks. And uh, back then, when we were much younger, we were learning from the things that had happened before. Uh, when you were trying to build a movement, you didn't necessarily know how to do it. And uh, you would uh, look to other, other experiences, whether it be the labor movement or uh, women's struggles or the right to vote. All of these things are real important and they're parts of our history that it's important to cherish. Um, so in 1968, um, I was living in Uptown and a little bit of information before that, I grew up in a town in Connecticut. It was a pretty plush town, uh, Westport, Connecticut, but it also had farms and a lot of Irish and Italian workers and old New Englanders. And uh, somewhere along the line, I, I acquired a sense of justice and a little bit of a rebellious streak. Um, I was a football player and I liked chasing girls and I was in the hot rod cars and schools were not the most important thing for me. Uh, I, I ended up, uh, without too much detail, I ended up going to Lake Forest College. I uh, was in, uh, you work here too? I just finished paying my daughter's school. <laughs> it was cheaper then. And I lost that old money. Um, I still do. <laughs> I got a job in the summer of 1960 in a cannery in California, and my, uh, my dad had always encouraged me to go other places and go west, and he had pushed me kind of to go to school out west, and I ended up going to Lake Forest because it was closer to my girlfriend at Yukon, and I, uh, on my way to California to work in the cannery, uh, I stopped in Lake Forest. I had applied to all this college placement service, and there were actually literally almost a hundred schools I think I got accepted at that I had never heard of. So when I when the letter came from Lake Forest, he said, "Oh, that's a good place. I used to go to dances up there." And he was a uh, he had grown up in the South Shore and gone to I won't go into much detail on my dad. But I stopped at Lake Forest. I went out to California, worked in a cannery, uh, came back uh, and went back to Lake Forest. And I spent four years there, and it was a, a really a pretty wonderful experience, I gotta say. Um, it was close to Chicago, I had some great professors, uh, 
And uh, we came down to the city. I ended up going to blues clubs, and jazz clubs on the south side where you were the only white kid. Uh, we ended up integrating the barber shops in Lake Forest. We ended, we would not cut the African kids' hair, and then a year later they wouldn't cut the uh, the African American kids' hair. And uh, so the issue started to happen for me. And one of the things I remember was a mat San Francisco to Moscow peace march, where uh, this motley crew of kind of long-haired hippies came through in 1962, uh, during which time I had just signed up for the platoon leader corps in the Marines. I had always wanted to be in the Marines and had practiced crawling on my stomach and, uh, you know, we, were, we wanted to be a Marine. And so I signed up. And then these people came through town and they talked about peace. And they talked about anti-atomic uh, uh, testing, those kind of issues. And it really just turned me around. So in 64, I uh, graduated with honors. I went to the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, where I showed up on campus uh, with my attache case, my cowboy boots, my, uh, I had a, a sport jacket, I had big sideburns and a big mustache and a lot more hair. And um, uh, the free speech movement was, was you know, just taken off. Uh, Jack Weinberg, who was here in Chicago uh, working for Greenpeace these days, I think still, he was in a police car surrounded by the police uh, no, surrounded by the students who wouldn't let the, him be arrested or taken away. And what was going on there was the university had said that uh, they, they didn't want students raising money for off-campus activities. So lo and behold, uh, the free speech movement was born. Um, I was involved with that. It was my first real arrest. And uh, during the course of that fall, when we had taken over Spell Hall, and we had lots of demonstrations, uh, I found a piece of paper on the ground that said, build the interracial movement of the poor. And I was a serious sociology student at the time, and I was uh, figuring out how you would use conflict theory to bring different races and ethnic groups together. I had grown up uh, like a lot of people in the country who uh, believed in the melting pot and that everybody could, could make it, and America was a, a really a wonderful place. I did not know yet about uh, the American nightmare, the other side of the dialectic, uh, where we do have some problems that we are still addressing to this day. Um, so uh, I got involved with this interracial movement of the poor. We moved into West Oakland to try to organize poor blacks in that case uh, to uh, struggle for the issues that affected their lives. And it was probably the wrong time for mostly white kids, but not all, to be in a black neighborhood. Um, and it was also the time that the U.S. had uh, amped up the war in Vietnam, and you had these troop trains that would come through, bringing soldiers or, you know, conscripts to be sent off to Vietnam. And so the activity, you know, we would be in the, in the neighborhood in West Oakland, and then we'd be up at, uh, you know, them trying to stop these trains. And I just remember the faces of these young guys in the, in the train as people were slapping the signs and yelling at them. And it's just kind of a fearful laugh they had. Um, I went to the Fillmore Auditorium for a benefit for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and I ran into Stokely Carmichael, who I don't know his, his African name. I never remember that, but Kwame something. And Stokely, I said, look, Stokely, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave school. I'm going to go work either in Chicago organizing poor whites uh, with Rennie Davis. Uh, who was is featured in the Democratic Convention activities, uh, or I'm going to go to Newark and work with Tom Hayden in the black neighborhood. And he looked at me and said, work with white people. He says, we've got plenty of things going on in, uh, in the black neighborhoods. We need more support in the white community. So uh, I spent a little bit of time working on my paper about different way organizing efforts among the poor, whether it be Alinsky models in Woodlawn. They had the Woodlawn organization or uh, the war on poverty's efforts at the time to, uh, you know, they had the war on poverty or the SDS projects, which were called the Economic Research and Action Projects. And I, of course, in my paper, the SDS projects came out the best. And um, I left in, in April. I had an interesting journey across country in my 57 Ford convertible, loaded with all my stuff. Uh, no harassment until we got to Des Moines when we got pulled over by the police as we were waiting for Fred Stover of the National Farmers Union, um, who had been Secretary of Agriculture under Roosevelt, uh, and had quit over the Korean War. Um, and uh, 
I ended up in Chicago, and we were about serious community organizing. We organized rent strikes. We had a welfare union. We were reaching out to uh, other communities, the Latin American Defense Organization and the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization. So you had poor Southern whites who were in uh, young guys and mostly welfare women, as well as blacks and Latinos building what I would say are the, the early seeds of the Rainbow Coalition here in Chicago. And um, when I first, uh, all of a sudden, Rennie Davis started to disappear. He went off to Bratislava to talk with the Vietnamese. And it was clear that his interests were somewhere else. And he was focused on the anti-war movement a lot. And, um, you know, I hadn't quite gotten there yet. I mean, obviously, I was opposed to the war. Uh, but uh, when they first started talking about the Democratic Convention coming to town, uh, I think I was opposed to the demonstrations. I thought it would kind of mess up our our slow organizing where you would be working with people over time to bring them along. And I mean, I was backward. I don't admit that very often. But I clearly was not on the cutting edge of that issue. But once it was coming, we got ready. And um, I will start sharing now some of the, the things that happened during that time. Let's we'll start with, I think it was Sunday night in Lincoln Park. And uh, it was at the southern end of Lincoln Park. Uh, just south of the farm and the zoo. And uh, I have to confess, we were laying on the kind of little berm that goes there along Stockton Drive, in, in my recollection. We were of altered consciousness. We were smoking weed. And um, uh, here came the truck with, uh, there was a truck, that big truck that had the MC5 band. And John Sinclair, and these are people I got to know later in my life. Um, and. Um, Really all I remember about that night was all of a sudden, here come the police marching. It must have been 11 o'clock. Uh, John printed up some, uh, like a list of things that happened in 68, and it says the police came in to close the park, and uh, they came in with gas masks. They came in, they setting off tear gas, and they drove us into the streets. And that, was, that would be a Lincoln Park, uh, Old Town area. And... Um, there was some violence. There were, you know, as they drove. What's that? Apparently they didn't. Apparently they didn't. They didn't use the truck as a stage. I see. That was their that was way of they didn't sticking like a finger in the eye. One of the things I think it's important to note that uh, my my good friend Paul Wozniak over here is here with his wife Mary, who worked with me on the live from the Heartland radio show. And Paul and I were in Rising Up Angry together, which is another part of my life until later. It comes later. Um, but that the police had, you know, in many ways had been getting pumped up around issues of, uh, uh, around civil rights and women and student demonstrations. There was, that thing was happening. And on the very, on May 9th, 44 years ago to this day, was the day that they issued a memo uh, beginning the COINTEL program, which was the counterintelligence program, which was infiltrating uh, progressive groups or radical groups from the SDS to the um, to black groups and in all kind of ways. I had that memo. I forgot to bring it. It was from J. Edgar Hoover. No kidding. Yeah, <laughs> straight from the top. Wow. See how important. So the, that was the first night, and uh, I'm I will say at this time I'm 70 years old now, and it was quite exhilarating. I I think being in the streets and rebelling against the police in that fashion. Uh, you know, I would take a much more toned down uh, position these days and try to cool things out and we could all work together. Uh, but, you know, it was a, we were pretty hostile to the establishment at the time. We were pretty hostile to the uh, Democratic Party in general. Change was coming a little bit too slow. Um, you know, excuse me? What was your draft status at the time? I actually had been, uh, I'd gone before a draft board in Connecticut. It was during that time that, it, when I was working at Joint Community Union in Uptown, uh, when uh, I remember going before my draft board in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and uh, them telling me that, you know, they, I was applying for a conscientious objector. And I didn't get it, and I told them, well, if you take me, I'll organize against you from the inside. I was, I actually got, uh, during that period, I was called to the to Selective Service uh, headquarters and I was supposed to report for duty and that kind of thing. 
And lo and behold, they said, okay, you have a one Y, which means that they don't, it's not a 4F, which it cuts you out of the deal completely, but it, it meant that unless they really needed you, they weren't gonna take you. Now, I don't know if my, I think of myself as a healthy dude. And um, I don't know if I really, if there was an issue or not, but they clearly didn't want me at that time. Uh, so that's what happened with my draft status. And uh, after that first Sunday night, my next recollection is, uh, there are two of them on Michigan Avenue. I'll tell you the, the easiest one first. Um, the, uh, we were down here, and I'm not sure of the day, but uh, I remember Dick Gregory, who was a, a track, he ran track at Southern Illinois. People don't really, they remember he was a great, um, you know, comedian. And I don't know what he's doing. Is he still alive? Yeah, he's alive. I love that guy. He's got a diet that he oh, I remember. Yeah, all this diet stuff. I have a picture of him with me and Bernadine Gorn and him somewhere. Uh, so it'll pop up in the archives. But uh, I remember he was out here on Michigan Avenue inviting us to come, come to my house. Come to my house. I'm inviting you all for lunch at my house. And the police clearly wouldn't let that happen. I think down further south they stopped us from going any further. And another thing that did go through here, but I do not remember it, but it was, I remember the Poor People's Campaign was coming on the scene then, uh, where people from all over the country went to Washington, kind of like the uh, bonus marches and, and stuff. I mean, they were camped out there. And uh, uh, Abernathy and the SELC, the Southern Conference Educational Fund, um, tried, they had a, a, a wagon with mules and stuff. Uh, but the big thing that happened for me, uh, it has gotten me attention over and over for many, many years. Uh, one photo makes a big difference. Uh, we were down here on Wednesday night, the 28th or 29th? I think it's 29th. We were in, it had to be, there was a, there was something went over at the band shell, which was down this way in those days. And uh, they, and, People moved in here. This was covered with people. And these are the, the movies you see. It, uh, as it said, and I think in the information you gave me, it wasn't the, the, the most heated moment of all the stuff that went on, but it certainly was the one that got the most attention. And I was down here with a few uh, young guys. Uh, we were, uh, the organization I was in, in Uptown with, Joint Community Union, was uh, kind of an ending then. And uh, I was getting ready to take what we had done in Uptown and try to do it in other neighborhoods. In other words, rather than just focusing in one neighborhood, we were gonna re go off and, and try to find young people in many neighborhoods who were kind of opposed to the war, who uh, were open to respecting women more, who were not overt racists or certainly would be converted. So I, the organization I went on to found was called Rising Up Angry. And it was part of the Rainbow Coalition with the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords, the Young Patriots. And I would have to add, it doesn't always get said, but the American Indian Movement in its early days. Um, so I was running with a group of uh, young toughs that uh, I had helped put together and recruit. We probably were wearing our leather coats. Uh, we had our combat boots. Uh, I remember, I think, in the photograph, I have a T-shirt. Um, and uh, we were in the middle of the of uh, Balboa, Michigan, and what I recall is pretty distinct in my mind is coming, must have come down here, careening into the middle of the crowd, driving everybody away was a squad roll or a paddy wagon, um, and which they were filling them up with people everywhere they could. And as soon as it came into the middle of the intersection, we started to rock it. Uh, there have been a lot of stories about uh, we tipped it over and these kind of things. We did not. We, we tried. <laughs> this is the, that's the picture. And this is our host here. <laughs> and this is Patrick Sturgis, who went to Lake Forest College with me and uh, was doing layouts of the Students for Democratic Society newspaper. And now is a, he worked at the Heartland, my restaurant. And then he went up to uh, Milwaukee. He started, he's involved with a restaurant and his wife called Beans and Barley. If you're ever in Milwaukee, it's a vegetarian oriented place. I think these two guys are uh, Warren Lemming, 
and I'm blocking the other name, but it'll come to me. They were in the band Wilderness Road, which hit some prominence just after that. They were on Columbia Records. This kid, I don't remember his name, Alan, I think, was uh, worked in the SDS National Office. So here we are. This schedule is, comes green, and we're rocking it. And it was rocking. I mean, it was, we were pushing on it. And I, if we had a few more people, maybe we'd have gotten it further. But nobody inside. No, they were inside. This, this guy. I know, I mean, I mean, no. no not, I don't know. And the logical so question that. is, did you get arrested? Uh, later. <laughs> later that I, night. No, not that night. I got arrested on the John Doe warrant in October. I was picked up doing, you know, I was working in some neighborhood. and. I uh, got pulled over, and uh, there was a John Doe warrant for me off of this picture. This uh, this cop in the driver's seat came out of the vehicle and grabbed one of the people here. And being an, uh, a fearless jock kind of guy, I took him down. I, you know, he was on some, I took him from the back, I put him on the ground. Uh, we were not yet into armed struggle. That came later. But I remember looking at his gun and I said, no, I'm not messing with that. <laughs> and I split. And that's really all I remember about that night, except that later on in the night, we, uh, we did that night or another night, we went rushing up to the armory up on Broadway, where the National Guard was. And uh, we spent a lot of time. You've seen pictures of people putting flowers into people's guns and bayonets. It was that kind of a situation. We were at the door. And one of the things I think is really important to remember, and it doesn't get a lot of attention in discussion about the Democratic Convention, there were a group of soldiers, 75, 80 soldiers at Fort Hood, Texas, mostly black, I'm not sure if they were all black, who refused to come to Chicago to be used as mercenary types to put down the rebellion. Um, and um, I kind of, this guy could fill in all the details. Al Cost, he photographed a lot of this stuff. Hi, Al. Thanks for coming down. Um, so that was a pretty, uh, that was a moving experience talking to the soldiers. I mean, because what we were about at that time, we really believed that uh, people, if they knew the truth, they could come around and, and get the picture and, you know, be part of it. So we were going to talk to the troops. I mean, what we were doing in the neighborhoods was we were talking about, we don't want to be uh, fighting black, white, black. You know, we want to get it together. The man is sticking it to us and that we have to stand together. Otherwise, we'll, we're just going to be up. Uh, fodder for his future wars, etc. Just to put this photo in context, on the other side of this truck at this time was this stuff going on. That's for sure. At, at, at the same moment. This here is a reporter from CBS who had been beaten over the head by a nightstick and was still working to get the story uh, after he had had his uh, injuries treated. And uh, the Haymarket anniversary was just a, about a week ago, and oddly enough, the restaurant at the corner of the Hilton right here was called the Haymarket, which is famous for a riot. <laughs> and this is some of the stuff that uh, precipitated it. You had people from all walks of life. You see a man in a suit and younger people. Uh, kind of uh, at an impasse here with these National Guard troops. And um, what was, uh, the National Guard did not really do anything violent during that time. They were just there to... No, but there were, uh, someone pointed out to me recently, there were Jeeps with these screen fences that were pushing people. You know, they, in my mind, as I recall, they were military kind of Jeeps. And they had barbed wire and... Right. Um, this picture here is right about where we're standing, I think taken from maybe up uh, near the top of the uh, Essex Inn or from one of the mid-level rooms there. Is that a good picture? Yeah, I got all my stuff to show. Show one, we got a picture? Would you yeah, want to yeah. This Al is a hell of a photographer and he, uh, he keeps bringing me the stuff for my little archives. I don't know what I'm going to do with all that. That's right over there. That's, yeah, that's uh, tremendous. This guy has hundreds of shots. He's got Woodstock shots. He's got Chicago shots. He's got Rising Up Angry shots. He's got Heartland shots. 
Carol Washington shots. Yeah, this looks like it was taken at right about the same time as that famous scene from the movie Medium Cool, which was on he's good. He's the good. Uh, he's good guy. John Thomas. Same Bridge name here. as the high jumper. Yeah, um, I was talking to uh, Haskell uh, uh, about it. Actually, uh, you see that car in there. Uh -huh. You see that actual piece. So, so that is yeah, almost exactly yeah, the time. It's almost like well, the movie Medium Cool, for, for those of you who don't know it, uh, it was filmed in 1968. Haskell Wexler, the famous cinematographer who'd done um, uh, what's, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, um, he uh, was filming an independent movie in Chicago. And he had heard about, he, he knew that there was going to be some sort of confronta confrontation coming up between the police, the National Guard, and uh, uh, young people and, and activists. And so he decided to film the, the activities that were going on and to weave a story into the actual footage of the police and the tear gas and the, the, um, the National Guard coming in. And it's a great movie, and I rec highly recommend it. Medium Cool is the name of the movie. And a lot of, a lot of people who we work with in Uptown and join and then later in Angry were uh, young Southern white or hillbilly kids were involved. Chuck Geary was in the movie, uh, who was a reverend on the street up there. Uh, the people who helped them on the movie, it's an interesting group of people, because uh, I'm a, I, I know Haskell is coming back for this next week, and he's 90. And Andy Davis, who directed uh, Under Siege, Above the Law, Code of Silence, uh, The Fugitive, uh, these are movies that I'm in, and I, I'm eternally grateful to Andy for using me in his movies because I have a pension from the Screen Actors Guild. And I, in my older age, I'm going to play an old guy more. But uh, they're coming to town next week, or this week, no, next week, to uh, uh, to shoot footage. They've got Gordon Quinn, who uh, from Cartem Quinn, and the, the Who Creams movie, and uh, the Interrupters movie, which is really hot right now. Uh, those guys are, uh, are going to shoot whatever goes on here. And uh, they certainly shot that stuff. And Mike Gray was also in that group, and he'll be here too. Mike Gray is the guy who wrote the China Syndrome and uh, did that movie. And they, not Hassel, but a number of them went on to make the movie American Revolution II, um, which is about, uh, has a lot of Democratic Convention stuff in it. It also has uh, Black Panthers talking with the, uh, the young uptown, young southern white kids, and it has the early scenes of when we were putting Rising Up Angry together uh, in an apartment out in Logan Square. So they'll be in town, and there's a lot of activity. What is that? Are they gonna? Yeah. They're just gonna shoot footage here while they're here. What? In the air? No, next week when the demonstrations, the NATO. Oh, come on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what they're worth. I, I have to say. That I was, I was actually looking forward to all of these activities that are, are going to happen uh, in whatever form or fashion. I, I admit that I have moved a little bit to my right. I am the president of the 49th Ward Democratic Party. Joe Moore is our alderman, and he is good. Uh, although we have to keep pushing him, Ernie. Yeah. He's a little too friendly with the mayor, and I've, I've been telling him that. Um, <laughs> but I'm not going to be able to be here. Uh, this, is, this is kind of the closest I'll get to it, probably. My, well, I have a daughter who uh, went off to Yale, and she graduates on Monday the 21st, so I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be there. You know, there'll be more demonstrations, though. So. All right, so uh, we can talk about uh, where we're at today, where we're going, how this all plays into it, or we can take a walk and, and look at the view at a choice spot. Well, we could, okay. we could walk over to the, uh, you have a, a number of, photos from the uh, uh, Lo uh, Logan statue over here. I do remember being at the Logan statue when the kid... And it's sunny over there, too. Yeah, yeah. let's go. Let's take a walk. <laughs> when uh, President Obama was nominated, um, a bunch of my girlfriends called me up and said, let's meet at Tear Gas Hill. <laughs> I knew what they meant right away, but I had never heard of this statue before. And we, it turned out all kinds of folks were looking up there. And I yeah. thought, when did this get the nickname? Why didn't I know about it? <laughs> you saw the kid that, that, that broke his leg? Yeah. 
I don't remember. I remember oh. the kid had an NFL flag up here. Yeah, there that? were a couple, but there's the famous guy here that was pulled out in the police field. Yeah, so like uh, uh, you know I'll tell that story. Yeah. Let me do it. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah. pictures. That's where I was. I was at Helix and they were in fucking traffic. I just saw he he I saw Helix is still over there. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, do they do really sound good. too? Uh, someone said that last night. I never sound heard that audio? before. Yeah. Any uh, sound equipment or any of that? Uh, maybe a few things, but no, mainly photographic and underwater and sports. Mm -hmm. uh, but on Wednesdays, you know, digital files are half price. So are you shooting digital now? Yeah. I gotta get a well, camera. Plus, I've converted everything. You know, I've scanned it all. Yeah, all, yeah, all that. That's from, yeah. Uh, well, that was a real print. But here's, this is just what I got it. Yeah. I love the digital thing. I gotta say, I'm uh, going. Um, yeah. I'm shifting. I'm gonna get a camera. I'm gonna get a fucking camera. I thought you had a little one, but uh, nah, that's I'm my daughter's. I'm buying cheap cameras. You what? Uh, I'm balking because they're getting better and better. They're getting better and better, bigger and bigger. Here, this is a, if you want to stop here, maybe this will be. We <laughs> conducted <laughs> in I remember distinctly, I mean, I've seen pictures of it, but I do remember, the, I remember this. And I'm in here somewhere. This kid gets pulled down with the NFL flag. Uh, NFL, NLF, National Liberation Front. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Al just reminded me he broke his leg when the police pulled him down. Um, you know. That picture, Al? No, not on that one, or you took that one. There are a lot of these, but this one is very nice because their sign says Butcher Daily. So oh. this was taken Thursday after the Wednesday night melee in front of the oh, wow. And you took it? So, yeah, that's why. Now the daily to butcher. The, the first time that they, <laughs> as they said, take the yeah, hill. It was many times, several times. Right. Several it days. wasn't it when they, um, it may have been after the, there was a, this was just about the time of LBJ's birthday. And the Yippies rented out the Coliseum, which was at 1500 South Wabash. And they had an unbirthday party. This was part of the kind of the mirth that they injected in all of their activist activities. And after the event was another one of the numerous times that the people who were there, there were over 2,000 people there, tried to march down to the, the uh, convention location. And this is another important thing. The convention was down at 43rd and Halstead at the International Amphitheater. And one of the reasons for that was because McCormick Place, the first McCormick Place, caught fire in January 1967 and burned to the ground. And one of the reasons that it burned so badly was because when they built it there on the lakefront, there weren't enough, um, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, yeah, hydrants. hydrants. Yeah, like there weren't enough fire hydrants because it wasn't part of the ordinary grid of, of the city. So um, I didn't include the, the picture of the bird out the corner place, but they had to have the um, convention at the International Amphitheater, which had also held a convention in the 50s. I believe the 56th Democratic Convention was there. Um, so it was a long way away from here. If it had been at McCormick Place, had there not been that fire, this entire area would have been even more volatile because the convention would have been held just about half a mile from here instead of three or four miles south. So then do you think, um, based on the proximity and what's coming up with the NATO, that uh, it's going to be more exciting here? Uh, well, it's definitely exciting because there's no other way to go. I mean, actually, one of the new additions they've got is now that there, there's no longer as many trains, they've opened up a busway down here in, in the, um, the uh, uh, kind of train uh, bed, below grade uh, train area. And if, if you want to walk over there, you can see it. But it's like an expressway to get from the, the uh, uh, north end of Grant Park down to uh, the place. So that's one way that's probably gonna take some of the pressure off the 
surface streets in terms of the uh, limousines and the convoys and whatnot. Now, let me... Do you, do you remember when we had the first big anti-war march that went to the Coliseum? Not a march, but we had a rally. I think it was 67, maybe 68. I just, uh, when you mentioned the Coliseum, uh, one of the, the things I got to do in my life was I got to give a speech to a large crowd. I w and I got the most applause. I was the sort of student radical. Dr. King was the other speaker, as well as Dr. Spock and Emma Macy from the United Auto Workers. So I have a copy of that speech somewhere. It's called Break Out and Do It Now, which was, you know, it's time we have to, like, give up this stuff and go for the better. You know, we have to break out and uh, take a stand on a lot of issues. And that's still the, the kind of position I put out to young people and old, anybody. I say, look, you know, wherever we're at, we can, we can play a part, we can play a role. Everybody has something to contribute. And you have to consciously put yourself in a position with other people that encourage you or help you go through changes. You know, that push you, whether it's, you know, that's probably what a family does, you know, your wife or the husband pushes the other person to be a better person. It's the same thing in your politics. You gotta, you know, if you got any bit inkling of what's, what's just and fair, you want to uh, manifest that in some way. Do you want to talk about um, how the events following Dr. King's assassination earlier in 1968 affected the reaction of the well, mayor? Well, I think that, uh, you know, Daly made that famous misquote or whatever he said, uh, police are here to disturb, to, how do you, yeah, preserve disorder. Yeah, preserve disorder. They're here to preserve disorder. I actually was at the SDS office uh, the day after, or the day King was killed. Um, and I remember, I was, it was on Madison, just west of Ashland. And 1608, I think, was the address. West Madison, it's out where the United Center is now. And it was, it was really something to watch from the window. Uh, you know, the, the masses were in the streets, there was a, uh, Walgreens a little bit to the east, and I remember this, that the uh, the great, the, you know, that was up was torn down, and people were in and tore the place apart. And I think that, uh, you know, that may have been Daly. Daly basically, uh, he criticized the police, uh, the police chief for, or the superintendent for how he had handled stuff. He kind of gave the okay to shoot to kill. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he certainly had a, an, had an omnipotent kind of a position like he couldn't be messed with uh, around the Democratic Convention. And, you know, my senator, as a kid growing up, there was Abraham Ribicoff, and I remember him at the convention, and now, you know, I don't remember it, it was in the news or I saw it later, but, you know, he challenged Daly, and he challenged uh, what was going on in you know, the streets and the way people were being treated, and Daly was mouthing off, and, you know, the lip sync reader types of... Uh, have said he was saying all kind of nasty stuff. He said they were using Gestapo tactics on the streets of Chicago, and that just set Daly off, and he was screaming back at him, and, and uh, you know, his son Richard, his son Richard was right next to him, you know, giving him the same treatment. And Richard, you know, the people who love the trees and the bike stuff that he did, but he screwed us. And I, and I think that just is going to come come more and more clear how, how, what a position he put us in. And I, you know, I would have liked to think that he would have, uh, you know, Harold Washington was a real gift. Uh, any of you who were around then, he was a fair man, he was a principled guy, he was sharp, and I wish he had eaten better and taken better care of himself, because we had it here. We, you know, he does not, he's not, in the, you know, pumped up and talked about the way a lot of other civil rights leaders are, or even politicians. But he was a guy that was really important, and he was fair to all the different neighborhoods, and he uh, laid some groundwork. I did mention the Rainbow Coalition, um, and you know, before Jesse Jackson used that term, Rainbow Coalition, uh, the, the, in that movie Medium Cool, when you see these Southern white kids, they're the same ones that show up in American Revolution II. And uh, Bobby Lee, who is, uh, was a Black Panther, an organizer, uh, who was, he made the link to the Patriots or the, the young guys up there in Uptown and um, they had these little hand-painted uh, buttons that were like all the colors, you know, red, brown, black, yellow, white. 
And um, I still have some of those in, I have these button collections stashed some places and uh, I gotta find my Rainbow Coalition buttons. But we basically, uh, I, in Chicago there were lots of people who were doing community organizing, who were doing work for a better world in whatever form or fashion they were doing it, who, uh, who were trying to work together and make links and ties to each other. And I think that it, it, it's really important to remember that that happened. This kind of organizing that came out of the, you know, in and around the Democratic Convention and after the Democratic Convention led to the, uh, the coalition that put together the victory for Harold Washington. And I would say if Harold Washington had not been elected the mayor of Chicago and we didn't have this history, we would not have Barack Obama as the president. And as much as I uh, can be critical of Barack Obama, um, I'm also, uh, I'm a fan and I'm rooting for him. And uh, I hope most of you are too. Because we, it would be something else if we had. So the, one, the poster boy for the 1% in the White House. Well, we'll walk up here uh, and get a look. You can see the, the busway and uh, we can look across to the other part of Grant Park where there were also some altercations that happened where the, the band shell used to be. Uh, Once you step here, it's crumbled. I don't know. They're, I don't get. The, I don't get the feeling that it's going to. I think it's going to. I hope. I hope some people. The same. I don't know if that's. You can bet if the weather is really warm. <laughs> so be people. Because what happened here? These scare tactics are more than. Well, of course, they would shoot the kill. But well, let me, I'm going to say, tell, say something about the crowd. The local Chicagoans, because, yeah, because there was held the permit to the last second, uh, there was uncertainty, and that's why APEC and the C uh, did not endorse the convention, did not have it. Just talking about there was not a lot. Yeah, maybe only five thousand. No, I think there was more. Ten. Not that much. But there, you, here's what happened. Here, here's what's key. Yeah, there was there was look, look, what, once, once the action started to happen, people saw it on TV. My business partner at the Heartland Cafe, Katie Hogan, um, was a young uh, Catholic girl from the South Side who was kind of involved in some early civil rights stuff. Her dad was the deputy com uh, building commissioner and the chief electrical inspector, wrote the Chicago Code, and she had a job at City Hall. And she said the minute she and a bunch of other people found out what was going on and they saw it, everyone came downtown. And that's, that was key for us who went out in the next couple of years after that, organizing in these neighborhoods where people were thought to be racist and anti-black and, you know, more working class kind of youth, that they... When they saw the action and people fighting the police, they loved it. They loved it. And then the guys coming back from Nam over the next few years, you know, who told tales and stories, it just, it started to shift, you know? And you gotta remember that when, when there were, most people, like 70, 80% were opposed to the war. And then, then it shifted where, um, not, not opposed, they were for the war. Then it shifted and they were, uh, people were opposed to the war. And then as soon as the, the uh, Iranian thing happened, you know, everyone wanted to bomb Iran again. It was like the people go like this, you know? Sometimes people are advanced, sometimes they're backward. And that's just the way it is, you know? We have to work on the momentum and we have it and uh, lay low and do education and uh, plan for other times when things are not going our way. Um, One of the tactics that uh, Daily used was to keep uh, 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 to not give permits for demonstrations, and also the other thing was to strictly enforce the curfew in the parks, and those resulted in two of the biggest uh, the biggest confrontations. Um, the uh, mob, yeah, the mobilization against the war. They um, they had a uh, rally over across this gap here in Grant Park with 10 to 15,000 people. And that was one of the few 
events that actually got a permit. And it was given very, very late so that they couldn't get a larger crowd. Uh, but at that rally were uh, Norman Mailer spoke, uh, Dellinger, Dick Gregory, Allen Ginsberg, uh, Jerry Rubin, Tom Hayden. Um, and um, right about the time that it was about to end, the news came across from the amphitheater that the peace plank in the Democratic platform had been defeated. And that caused a lot of people to get very upset in the audience. And somebody scaled one of the flagpoles and brought down the American flag. And they put up a, a bloody t-shirt, a red bloody t-shirt. And that set off the police. And, and if you hold this for a second, some of these photos in here are from that altercation that happened um, just across here. Uh, it was... That's a media pool as well. Yeah, exactly, right. Uh, where she's wearing the yellow dress and she's walking amid uh, all kinds of chaos and violence. And you can see here's after it where the police move in. Um, here they are talking to uh, somebody who had been beaten. Almost all the daytime violence that happened was uh, amid that event. And you can see the benches that they had here, and people couldn't get over the benches trying to run away from the police, and so they were caught, and they, there were more injuries than usual. And then that's what led to the big confrontation later that night. You had all of these people in the park. The police would not let them cross these bridges. There was no Roosevelt Bridge at that time. <laughs> it was only a walkway. And the police and the National Guard had blocked off every way to cross to get back over to public transportation and ways for them to get out of the park. And so finally, what happened was they discovered that the bridge at Jackson was open and word spread throughout the crowd and they went around on Jackson and that's where you had the National Guard coming in and forming a line on a, a second perimeter on Michigan Avenue where they were all lined up uh, not letting anybody get into the streets right here. This is a good picture of it. And little by little, uh, you know, the events escalated. And at one point, um, it almost as if on cue is when the police said, you know, let's go and, and, and show them who's boss. The, the National Guard, for the most part, did not do any of that. They were a show of force. They were involved with some of the tear gas if there was to be a rush uh, uh, to their lines. Um, but, you know, people would break through at certain points and get caught. And there were actually a couple of windows on the Hilton that were broken from people being pressed up or thrown against the windows. And so some of the injuries came from that. And, um, you know, this is when the crowd was chanting, the whole world is watching. Um, you know, uh, uh, a timeless <laughs> chant that uh, everybody can kind of uh, hear in the back of their heads when they see these pictures. Um, so if you want to let me, let me say a couple of things about the police. Uh, you know, we were pretty hostile to the police in those days, and you remember the Black Panther Party a year later initiated the, the word pig for the police, and uh, I gotta say, we we didn't like the police much, and I, we, our position was the police are the, are, you know, the arm of the ruling class or in service of the ruling class that, while the police, and I still say it to this day, that policemen do a lot of, there are plenty of police to do good work and they're necessary to have. There are also police who really uh, are hostile to other people, uh, but back then, you didn't have a lot of college-educated ed police, you didn't have a lot of women police, you didn't have a lot of uh, Latino or, uh, Black police, you had some, but it was it was pretty white, and I think they were pretty uh, 
I would just say the word primitive for lack of a better word at the moment. But at the, at, you know, I gotta say that uh, the police over the years, and you know, uh, maybe it's coming with age, it's different, uh, the politics are a little mellowed. Uh, I think the police, there are a lot of people on the police force who, uh, who definitely understand what's going on in the world. And I mean, I have a guy who comes to the Heartland Cafe who is the union rep for his police, and he's, uh, he, he says, I'm going downtown. I said, are you going to be a cop downtown or a demonstrator? He says, both. You know, and he's in there. You know, he's always looking at Ad Busters magazine and buying. You know, he buy, He's just, and he's not the only one. Um, there is a, uh, a. I think it's how you found me a little bit. There is a history detective uh, a show called. Uh, it's the history detective. It was on uh, Channel 11, and it's been all over the country. It shows over and over, and it's about a poster that I made during that time. And it's a picture of what turned out to be not a police officer, but uh, a motorcycle a media camera guy, you know, film delivery guy. But he has sunglasses on, he has a white helmet on, the leather jacket, and he's just like this. And um, so I took that picture at the SDS office, and we made a poster. It said, Hot Town, Pigs in the Streets, but the streets belong to the people. Dig it? And I put a question mark. Later I changed it, I got an exclamation point. But um, I got a lot of publicity off of that uh, that poster, it turns out, when the history detective uh, tried to find out where that someone wanted to know where it came from. And they tracked it to me through a poster collective in L.A. to Salcedo Press here in Chicago. And uh, so there's a really nice thing that has Eddie Burke defending the... No, he's, that's a different one. That's a, there's a, B, a BBC thing, too, on the Democratic Convention uh, that I go up against Eddie Burke in some, uh, you know, there's me and then there's a picture of him, and we each have different positions. But the, the one on the history detective had a, a police officer who I think was really good about it. It's the best line I've ever heard the police take on uh, when, when down. He blamed the police for it. It's online. Speaking of which, oh, wow. yeah, you can get it online if you go to just Google history detective. Paul, do you have any other stuff you wanted to uh, share? You were a young guy then. I don't know if you were here, but you are a student of history. And uh, you sent me, sent me all these emails about stuff I should include. <laughs> and uh, if I was reading, I might include yeah. some of it. But do you have anything you sure. want to say? As well, a kid I'm a oral historian. I, I talked to a lot of people who were here, including some who were police cadets at one point. And what had happened in the months before uh, the convention, the FBI was around going to police departments all around the United States, telling them horror stories about these people coming in to, to destroy the town and sabotage things. And so they were all hyped up looking for these saboteurs. And an awful lot of the policemen at that time were World War II vets. They had uh, the trauma of military experience. And uh, they, they just it was like flipped the trigger. Uh, anytime there was a trigger flipped, and this happened three or four months before the convention in Berkeley and in New York City and elsewhere, given a chance they would go in and start beating people. With the pent up hostility and the trauma of war, uh, that is an untold story, but I've talked to the people and there are oral histories about that. You know, one thing about you talk about the police, uh, World War II vets, um, probably Korean War vets too, but I remember the Red Squad. Now, we don't, I don't know if they, they, they tried to bring it back. Uh, I remember there was a settlement that uh, even some progress, a lot of people got a little bit of money uh, to the organizations off of the, you know, we used to be followed by the police and the Red Squad had uh, had a lot of Eastern European guys, and they were really kind of hard ass. The Irish guys were a little more mellow. And I remember, uh, I can remember one time driving by the uh, the Golden Nugget up on uh, Lincoln Avenue near well Waveland, I think. Uh, and I used to go get salads there when I was starting to get into the healthy food deal. And I remember pulling by there, and there was Maury Daly who was a guy who was always after us, sitting in there, and we just kind of looked at each other and kind of did this and kept going. Later on, he became a, uh, he was a, in, in uh, the 20th district up in Rogers Park, and he calls the Heartland and he, he says, uh, 
he asked if I was there, and someone said, no, he's not there. Well, tell him Che Guevara's nephew is looking for him. <laughs> and then we ended up seeing each other, and I remember hanging out with him on stakeouts, you know, when he was trying to bust some people. Uh, he ended up being uh, the commander over at Fillmore, uh, and his son played football at Lake Forest later, I played earlier, and uh, he passed away. There's another, uh, another Red Squad cop who gave me pictures and information named Eugene Dorniker, who used to show up at the Athletes United for Peace races that we put on at the Heartland. Uh, and I haven't seen him for the last year or so, but he was around a lot. So, and there was another guy on the Red Squad who I remember interrogating me in 69 after I was arrested outside the Black Panther office. And, um, you know, I would tell these guys, you know, I'm not going to share any information if I even knew. I remember the FBI one time getting me and asked, looking for Bernadine Dorn. And I said, you know, I don't know where she is, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Well, thank you for being so honest, Mr. James. But this other guy in the Fillmore lockup comes in, uh, talks to me. A few years later, he's eating at the Heartland and goes down to uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas to open a natural foods restaurant. So it's like, uh, you know, people change. And it's crucial to remember that. Uh, you know, it's sometimes in the heat of the struggle, you don't remember that. But I think we want to keep our, our, our highest humanitarian selves, but also take positions that are firm and stand up for what we believe. Because uh, we only got one shot here in life, and we want to make the most of it. And while I would like to not get into too much trouble uh, as I go forward, I think that uh, there is a certain joy about seeing things change and improve or at least taking a stand at things as they deteriorate and go downhill. The, the struggle changed. The struggle does change. The tactics change. The, uh, the methods change. The, the issues change. But some of them remain the same. Yeah, that's my point. The people do change. The struggle actually remains. It, it may change, you know, variety of it. But, but uh, our struggles are, I'm going to look at what you were saying earlier and what's happening now. It's not too dissimilar. <laughs> you know, it's worse now than it ever was. I mean, you got you got black people. All all races are in all kind of levels and positions, clearly. But uh, the, uh, the situation of humanity is in rough shape, and uh, it's not like we can can't change it. Uh, I remember going on my way to to Nicaragua. We went down there with Athletes United for Peace a couple of times during the Sandinista period playing baseball, and uh, I was on this old Greek airline. Uh, a plane that the Nicar Nicaragua had. It was the Nic they had two planes in the Nicaraguan air, whatever the planes were. And I remember we had a copy of Granma, which is a paper that the Cubans put out. And I remember reading a, a, a speech that Fidel gave. You know, and people like they, you know, they always talk about oh he harangues people. And all. The guy has clearly got a lot of, a lot of stuff working here. And in that, what I came away from that article with was, he talked about how kind of misery in the hemisphere was increasing in geometric proportions. Two, four, 16, however, you know, the mathematicians would do that. But it, it just seems to me it's important to remember that. Well, I, I was accused once of by my uh, Christian ethics professor at Lake Forest when I wrote a paper on Gandhi, where I talked about, and things will get better. He said, not necessarily. He called me ameliorist which I guess meant that some, someone who believes that things will improve. And he pointed out to me a number of historical cases where they didn't improve. So that was an awakening for a young kid who was idealistic. Um, what I tell people today, you know, I've been blah, 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 running my mouth here, but I basically encourage people to do good in the world because the world needs all the good that you do. That's how we end our radio show. We have a, a show called Live from the Heartland. It's on the WLUW 88.7 every Saturday morning. Uh, from 9 to 10. You can be in the live listening audience at the Heartland. You can listen on uh, FM if you're in the region or you can go online to www.wluw.org. And uh, if you want to see earlier editions, um, and our interview with Obama is not up. We did one when he ran for the Senate. Um, I've got him on, I've got him actually on, when we were on the radio, I asked him about industrial hemp. I asked him about Cuba and he was really hard. But he also said, I have him on video saying he's open to medical marijuana <laughs> a little later on. So we'll wait and see what happens. But this, um, we'd love to have you uh, listen to the show. You can look at youtube.com slash heartlandmedia and you can find 
lots of interviews. I'm, Paul puts them up, there's probably five or six hundred segments now. And uh, how many of you have ever been to the Heartland? Well, that's good, so you know what I'm talking about. Well, I have a, a little... Describe it. The Heartland Cafe came out of my teaching at Columbia College. Um, I, was, uh, it was, um, I was in this group rising up angry, things were starting to taper off, the war had ended in Vietnam. Uh, what was the next step? I wanted to change Rising Up Angry into an organization called The Rising of Us All. Uh, the organization voted to sell the building we had on Belmont, with, right at Racine, uh, where there's a fireplace place now. And let me tell you, we went into that building, we fixed it up. There are steel plates in the entryway where we had a bookstore. Because those days, we, everyone was talking. We used to be at the gun range with uh, the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, the Rising Up Angry, and the police all out at uh, uh, whatever the gun shop on in Bellwood, in Bellwood on Mannheim Road. Uh, so it was some serious stuff at that time. And um, anyhow, so I'm uh, back to Columbia College. I'm teaching at Columbia. I'm teaching this course called Organizing for Social Change. I'm talking about the farm workers. I'm talking labor history, civil rights, all these things. And I developed what I call the mini red economy. And I don't think that other people probably other people have thought of these things too. But it's basically community-based institutions that serve the people's needs. And I was talking about all these little businesses like bicycle repair co-ops, auto repair co-ops, photography studios, daycare centers, record stores, recording studios, restaurants, bakeries, anything that people needed. You know, we were going to uh, create this economy and uh, we would just by osmosis or somehow we would overthrow the government. <laughs> so, and I had been reading Mao Zedong on base areas in China and the role of economic institutions, uh, the role of uh, credit unions and things in the struggle for independence in Kenya. Uh, I'd been influenced by New Harmony, Indiana and the uh, Manic Colonies in Iowa, these kind of Christian uh, communist sects, you know, the Hutterites and these people. So I was studying all that, and so I started talking about this mini red economy, and we thought the restaurant would be the heart of it. And some woman got up and or came to me and said uh, she would loan us some money to do it, and she never did. Uh, her name was Georgia, and she um, opened a restaurant just about the same time we did on Sheffield called Mama Peaches, which was uh, pretty much all gay women. Uh, I met a couple of men who worked there later. I thought I was the only guy they let in there. But, <laughs> She never gave us the money. We borrowed uh, $4,000 from a number of people. Uh, we started working on May 1st, and we skipped any May Day demonstrations, which there weren't too many happening at that time, but there were some. And uh, we worked on the building. We had family and a few friends, and um, uh, it took us 40, took us until August 11th till we were ready to open. We, were, we had four grand, we were down to $200. We went to the Greater Illinois People's Co-op on South Water Market, we bought some food, and we opened to 43 people. And we've been there ever since. Uh, you know, we've had Harold Washington there, we had Obama there, we've had Studs Terkel there. We've had lots and lots of people through there. And lots of people have come out of there and opened other places, who are active in unions and teaching, and you know, it's really been an incubator for good stuff. And um, we have had a couple of hard years financially, and uh, lo and behold, uh, when we had a benefit a year and a half ago to raise some dough, uh, people really came forward, and it was it was really wonderful. And one guy who came forward wanted to buy the place, and uh, I didn't want any part of it. Uh, but this winter, like December, things are really tight again, and I'm thinking maybe he just put some money in because really what I need is a chunk of money. And um, so he's going to be our new partner. He's going to be the majority partner. Uh, he clearly has some dough. Uh, he's a farmer. He has an organic farm in Michigan called. Uh, uh, Earth First, and uh, they raised a lot of chickens, and they got the cider, and you know, those other farmers. So it's going to be a little bit more of that uh, farm to table notion, although, you know, he wants to stress the new food stuff. Well, we've always had organic things. I just didn't push it as much. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to this because we have this radio show. I get to work in movies. I got a bunch of books the Rising Up Angry book, the Heartland of 35 book. Uh, my Mexico 62, I didn't even talk about driving my motorcycle to Mexico in the old days. I got a lot of work to do, and um, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, seeing all of you uh, up there or anywhere else. 
I'm at Michael at Heart Michael at HeartlandCafe.com. You can always find me. All right. Good. Great. And what do you do? I know you know all these women. <laughs> I'm a dean at East West. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good. And how many of you are connected to East West? Uh, they're they're good. telling us that more people. I hadn't known about it. I gotta, I gotta say. You should come over. I'm looking forward to We're teaching there. Invite you to come and, <laughs> and speak to. You know, Anytime. The, uh, well, this was Anytime. this was known and documented back in the uh, yeah. are you like 68. A, uh, what's happening? It seems that it happens regularly. Yeah. Oh, to raise the anxiety level, and uh, also it, it helps justify more uh, grants and gifts to uh, the police. Uh, Yeah.